And so our team just joined in with that. We did kids ministry. Um, we, we shared testimonies. We walked to the streets of the community where we were, um, inviting people to the church and, and giving them gospel tracts and, and praying for people, praying with people as we had the opportunity to do ministry in the streets. We poured concrete. Um, we um, were very busy. I got to preach a whole bunch of times via translation, which let me say it's nice to just talk to you without having to pause as someone translates next to me. I got four times. It was, it was really amazing, an amazing opportunity. Kylan and I both got the opportunity to preach at the church down there via translation, but I like kind of just telling you and not having to wait. And I have to think, does this translate? And, and my sense of humor does not translate. I know that for sure. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't come across well down there. So, um, and all the cultural references I use, man, it was challenging. But, but what an incredible, um, incredible week. And thank you for your support. Thank you for praying for us while we were down there. And again, more to come about that. So at the end of a week like this, down in Mexico, there's always an opportunity to go do a little bit of sightseeing, a little bit of souvenir shopping. And so we had an opportunity to go and, and go to a place where there was stores and souvenir stuff and, and do, bring some souvenirs home. And one of the hot items that people were bringing back was vanilla. Now, if you might know this, vanilla is a lot cheaper down in Mexico. You can get a big old bottle, you know, for what it would cost you for a tiny bottle here in the U.S. And the, the, the way this works when you walk into these little marketplaces is there's no price tags on anything, right? So you say, how much does this cost? And you hold it up, and they say, hmm, for you, it's, you know, uh, and they, they give you a starting price. And I look at this, and I think our adult leaders that were down there looked at this sort of as a game. It's like, oh, boy, here we go. I like this game. Time to negotiate. And I, I would never do this like at McDonald's, you know. How, how much is that Big Mac? And, and then try to talk them down. You know, we don't do that here in this culture. But there it was part of the deal. It was kind of part of it. It was expected. And so our youth were very uncomfortable with this. They were like, I don't like this. And the adults, like myself, were like, here we go. You know, we really did enjoy it in, in sort of a game. And so everyone was trying to buy vanilla. That was a hot item. And I kind of didn't get it. I'm like, what's the big deal with vanilla? And they're like, it's so much cheaper here and it's better quality than what you get in the store and it's, it's such a good deal. And so I, I just kind of passed on the whole vanilla thing, but a lot of people brought vanilla home. And wouldn't you know it, when I walk home, I mean, when I get home and walk into my house after nine days of being away, my wife had been baking. And so I look at the grocery list on the refrigerator and what's on there? Vanilla. <laughs> Should have bought some while I was down there. But when you walk into these marketplace areas, the people... They see you walk in and they sort of size you up. Like, I wonder what this guy is going to be interested in. And so they start offering things before you even tell them what you're looking for. And they looked at me and they said, Cuban cigars. We've got Cuban cigars for you. Um, Rolexes. And, and, then I, and then I was thinking, Rolexes? You really have Rolexes here in this marketplace? And I know what that means, right? you got a Rolex for sale in this little marketplace area it's probably not a real Rolex, right? Odds are, I'm going to look at this thing and it's not going to look like a real one. Not that I wouldn't know. I'm not like a watch guy necessarily. But odds are it's not real. And there's things that you, you can look for. I, I watched like a video last night about Rolexes, the real versus the fake ones. And, you know, one of the things you look for with the Rolex is that it's the, the second hand should kind of roll. It should be kind of a constant smooth motion instead of ticking. If your Rolex is ticking, it's not a real Rolex, just, just so you know. And I, I've been in these kind of situations before. When I was in the military, I went to, um, to Turkey, and we had marketplaces very similar to these, and we were walking through the marketplace, and they'd have clothing, a stall set up with clothing, and there'd be belts and shirts and different things like that, and it's, and it's like, oh, this is Ralph Lauren stuff and Calvin Klein. And I remember seeing, picking up a belt in one of these marketplaces, and it said, Clavin Clean instead of Calvin Klein. I'm like, I don't think this is real. I think the real ones, they spell it right, you know? It's funny when you're in situations like this and you're looking like the true thing versus the counterfeit thing. They can look very similar. Uh, the Cal Clavin Klein was pretty obvious that wasn't a real Calvin Klein belt. But many times we look, we look for the real thing versus counterfeits in situations like this, and the stakes are somewhat low. It's not that big a deal. 
You know, plenty, plenty of people bought knockoff things when I was in the military. I remember people would say, yeah, I'll take that. And no big deal, whatever. Not, not, a, not as big a deal. But when you think about um, what Jesus tells us about today in Matthew chapter 7, he's pointing us towards to look at certain things in our life and certain things around us to look for what is false and what is true. Say, I want you to look out for counterfeit situations in your life because the stakes for these are higher. And he's going to talk about um, indicators, just like you would look at a Rolex, and if it's ticking, it's not a real Rolex, it's a more smooth motion. He's going to say, when you look at spiritual teachers, people who claim to speak on behalf of God, there's something to look for that will tell you whether or not they're true or false. When you look at your own faith, there's something to look for that will tell you whether or not it is true or false. And when you look at your life and what it's built on, there's something there as well that will tell you whether or not it is true or false. So with Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 to 29, we're wrapping up our study in the Sermon on the Mount. This is our 10th week in this study, and we're going to um, finish our time together in, in, in this series by reading verses 15 to 29. So we'll start by reading that big chunk of scripture. We'll go back and look at some lessons that we have to learn about false teachers versus true teachers, false faith versus true faith, and false foundations versus true foundations. Let's jump in. Matthew 7, starting in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased, fruit bear, diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And when, Je when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. This is a moment here where Jesus finishes the sermon, and it's like a mic drop moment. He's like, he's, the house fell, great was the fall of it, drops the mic. <laughs> and everyone is amazed the crowds, these people that have listened to him, you know, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, but he's also speaking to these larger crowds. He's comparing his kingdom versus the rival kingdoms. And he's saying, this is the way it is in the kingdom of God. Let me tell you about the kingdom of God. And through this sermon, he has been reading our mail, right? He's been cutting right to our hearts, and he's been challenging us as a church as we've been going through this, and certainly challenging the crowd that, that was listening to him. And what stood out about Jesus was his authority. The, the teachers during this time would often appeal to some other teacher. They would say, well, Rabbi so-and-so says this, and, and this rabbi says this, and they would appeal to other people's authority or appeal to some interpretation outside of themselves. But Jesus says, let me tell you the truth, and let me tell you what is real, and let me tell you about my kingdom, and let me tell you about the rivals and how they fall short. And he was teaching with such authority that the crowds, it says, they were astonished at his teaching. Wow. He's unlike anything we've ever heard before. And Jesus offers a series of warnings to the, to the listeners. He says, you need to look out for some counterfeits. The first thing he tells them is you need to look out for false teachers instead of, and you need to look for true teachers instead of false teachers. And this is, a, this is an interesting one, right? This is a, a, tough, a tough one when you think about what Jesus tells them, right? Look for false teachers. Look out for false teachers. And you read the New Testament and you read the Old Testament 
and you see that this is a real problem that Jesus and even the Old Testament prophets and you know, God speaking to these prophets was always warning them, hey, there are going to be people who represent me, people who claim to speak on my behalf, and they're false. They're not real. And if you look at some of these other passages that kind of build this profile of what these false teachers look like in, in the New Testament, they're, they're really, they're in it for their own gain. You know, they're in it to take advantage of of other people. And so discernment is necessary. Not everybody who has a book in the Christian bookstore or who speaks on TV or who even pastors a church, there, there are not every one of them are true teachers. There will be some false teachers mixed in with that. And so it requires discernment. And Jesus gives a simple test. He says, you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them by what their life Produces and it might take time. To, fruit doesn't, you know, it takes a season for fruit to grow. But you can make conclusions about a plant from its fruit, right? When you see the fruit, then you know for sure what that plant or what that tree is, right? So you got a tree, and I, I'm not great with trees and things like that, you know, growing things. I, I, I don't, my, I'd like to learn more, but I don't know a lot about it. We talked about this with my avocado thing a couple of weeks ago, right? I don't know how to pick a good one and things like that. I'm not great with that kind of stuff. But I know that when I see an apple on a tree, guess what I know? That's an apple tree, right? Even though I don't know a lot about trees and what, what the shape of the leaf should be and what, what an average apple tree looks like, I know, hey, that tree has an apple on it. Odds are it's an apple tree. I've got this one. You know, so when you see a tree and you see the fruit that it produces, right, like, oh, that's a cherry tree because that tree has cherries on it, or that's a tomato tree because that tree has tomatoes on it. What? I'm just kidding. I know that tomatoes don't grow on trees. I was just joking. Just make sure you're paying attention, and you are. Good job. Okay. Jesus says the same thing about people about people who claim to speak on behalf of God, that their life will produce something eventually, and you'll know at that point, is this a true representation of Jesus? Is this person really speaking on behalf of God, or are they a false teacher? And, like, this is not something that I feel super comfortable with, honestly. I'm not going to give you my list of people who I think are false teachers. I, like, that's, this is a, this is a, I mean, maybe I will if you want to ask me after the service, but I'm not, not from here I'm not going to, not from up on the stage. But this is challenging that there, there are people, and this is a warning, that the scripture tells us often enough that this is a real challenge and something that we need to look out for. I think in addition, when we think about our own lives, this is a helpful thing for us to think through. What is our life producing? What is the fruit of my life. And Jesus gives, really continues to go from this outward thing, looking out for, not everybody, you shouldn't listen to everybody who claims to speak on behalf of Christ. You need to be discerning. We need to think about it and, and, and look for fruit and, and be discerning about who we allow to speak into our hearts and into our lives. But then he says, that's an outward thing. Think about who you're going to allow to speak to you, but also inwardly Look into your own heart and your own faith. And then he talks about this kind of second idea, which is even more sobering than the first one. False faith versus true faith. He says this in verses 21 to 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. If we understand what Jesus is saying here, this is serious. This is sobering. This is like, this is a big deal. One of the things that Jesus is saying, is, saying here is that he is claiming to be the judge. He is claiming to be the one who on that day will be able to say like, nope, I, I never knew you. Um. He says, those who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who says that, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus is describing himself with, with this is a powerful moment, a statement about who he is as being the righteous judge of all the universe, being able to say to one group of people, enter into 
the place I prepared for you and another group of people depart from me, I never knew you. And he says, many people will say to him on that day, we did all the stuff for you. We, we said things on your behalf. We, we did these spiritual miraculous works on your behalf. We did mighty works in your name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You were a worker of lawlessness. There's a discussion, kind of an in-house discussion in the church where we, we there's a theological um, debate. There's people who give talks and write books on this topic of the way that we present what it means to be a follower of Christ in the church. That there are many, there's a, there's a, um, a, a group of people that are concerned that we make it seem very easy, like you're just stamping a ticket. You've got your ticket punched. Ticket to heaven, got ticket punched, good to go. I prayed the prayer. I did the thing where I raised my hand and I responded to the gospel and, and I am, I'm good to go now. And there's a risk that we present what it means to follow Jesus differently than Jesus actually presents it. And we can cheapen what Jesus did on the cross and we can make it seem like, hey, it's just a simple thing that you do where you pray a simple prayer and then you are eternally secure. And in fact, Jesus describes faith differently than that. He describes following him as being something that, is, that it changes trajectories. This is something that once you are one of his children, it should affect your life in some way. And, and that someone who, who simply prayed a prayer but has, bears no indication that their life is Christ's should not feel secure that they are Christ's, that Christ is their Savior. That, that saving faith, that faith in Christ should transform us. Faith in Christ, not that we are perfect. I, I would no, and never in no way say that. We, we are not perfect, but we are repentant when we fail and we are choosing to follow him. And there should be some indication when we consider our lives that we are Christ's children. And we don't want to present the gospel in such a way when we tell people, like, here's what it means to follow Jesus, that that it's just as simple as getting a ticket punch. They prayed the prayer, they said the magic words, and now they're good to go. That's not the way Jesus describes what it means to follow him. It is your life should resemble a change of some kind. There should be some indication when you consider your life. Jesus says specifically, specifically, that it has to do with God's will. He's saying people who are his, people who have true faith, want to do the will of God. They, they, they do God's will. They want to follow God's will, not our own will. That Jesus is the leader. All the stuff we've been singing this morning, that, that you are my king, that the transformed soul, that's what, they, that's what they claim, that you are my king, that they want to follow Jesus. They, want to, they, they didn't just, they did pray a prayer, but it's more than that. It's something that where they're actually following Jesus now. You know, Americans overwhelmingly claim to be Christian. It's something like 76 to 83 percent of the American population says, yeah, I'm a Christian. And I think what Jesus is saying here is that just it's not a cultural thing. It's not something where just, yeah, I'm, I'm a Christian because I'm an American and America is largely Christian. And so because I'm American, I'm a Christian. It's, it's more than that. It's something that where you want to do the will of God. Not that we don't we don't perfect perfectly do it every time but we we realize that God is our king he's the one who gets to call the shots with our life see we sometimes like to make a third category Jesus uh, during in Matthew 7 backing up to even last week where Brad Dunn was uh, giving the sermon <laughs> see the inside jokes you have to come every week and then you'll get those but uh, Brandon last week was was um, talking about the two paths there's the wide path and the narrow way, and, and then now Jesus is continuing to give the, this idea of there, there's these there's com- contrasts, false teachers, true teachers, false faith, true faith, and there's really just two options. And we like to make a third option a lot of times. We, we like to say, well, there's the option where you, you are a Christian, but you're just not following Jesus, and you, it doesn't really look like you're a Christian from looking at your life, but but you, you, you prayed the prayer, and there's this kind of third option, and Jesus does not give us a category for that. He says there's false disciples and there's true disciples. There's the crowd and there's his followers. And the key issue has to do with who's in charge of your life. Do you do the will of 
your father or do you do your own will? What's the most important to you? And this is sobering and this moment of kind of discomfort <laughs> that, I, that I feel with this passage and that you might feel. We'll, we'll talk more about what to do with that, those feelings in just a moment. But faith is so critical. Faith is the important piece of this, right? If you look at James chapter 2, James talks about saving faith, what real faith looks like. He says real faith works. Real faith does something. Saving faith actually has activity associated with it. The activity is not what saves you. It's faith that saves you. But when you have real faith, there's some action with it. There's some works associated with that. Not, we don't earn it, but it's a result of it. It's, it's how we work out our, our, the faith that we have. It's more than a feeling. It's more than um, a, a moment in time. It, it's, it's a life. It's a new life that we get, a new creation kind of life. When you study the life of Christ, um, one of the things that stood out to me when I think about his life and the different stories about, about Jesus is what he noticed about people. And there are several stories where Jesus um, notices someone's faith. He's like, that's, that's a nice faith. I like that one. Luke 7, verse 9, um, Jesus is talking about a centurion who asks Jesus to heal his servant. And it says, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, turning to the crowd that followed him. He said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. This guy's faith, it's great. Two thumbs up on this guy's faith. You know, the things that we notice about people tell us a lot about ourselves, right? The things that we notice about our surroundings, what impresses you, what, no, what you notice, um, tells you about your, diff, you know, your, your personality, your hobbies, the things that matters to you, right? You A perfect sports play, perfectly executed sports play, an incredible sports highlight. We notice that. We say, wow, that's amazing because we like that sort of thing. Or, or you see someone dressed in a really, they like, man, that jacket's really impressive. I like that jacket, you know. Or, or, or um, I was at Trader Joe's the other day and the guy that was checking me out at, at Trader Joe's that ringing me up there had this incredible mustache. I know that sounded funny. Let's just pretend I didn't say that. Um, the, he had this incredible mustache that was like, that was all twirled up and I was like, that I'm, I'm someone who appreciates facial hair. And so I had some comments about that, like, wow, that's amazing. And then he had a lot of things he wanted to tell me about his mustache, which was also kind of funny. Um, I'm like, is that, what do you use to make that stay like that? Is that mustache wax of some kind? And he's like, oh, no, that stuff doesn't work. It lasts for a couple hours, and then eventually it doesn't hold anymore. And so he told me about whatever product he used. But the things that we notice about people and about things and our surroundings, like, oh, is that the new iPhone? Or... Oh, when did you, oh, that's a great car. Or, you know, these things that stand out about what we notice tell us a little bit about ourselves, kind of what we care about. Jesus cared about faith above all. He was always looking for faith. He was looking around and saying, well, that faith, that's a good faith. I like that faith. And I'm struck by that, how interested Jesus is in our faith. And when we think about our own lives, we think about this idea, this sobering passage of true faith versus false faith, what would Jesus notice about our faith? What, what would he notice about what we believe or what we don't believe? And again, the thing he's looking for is, do you obey the will of your Father? Do you, is, does your faith look like that? Do, when you don't do it consistently, do you look to Jesus for cleansing and for repentance and our faith should work. Then finally, Jesus talks about false foundations versus true foundations. And he says it this way in Matthew 7. We'll read these verses again, 7, 24 to 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. One of the things that I love about this story, um, other than it reminds me of the kids' song I used to sing in Sunday school growing up, um, was that when I think about Jesus telling a story about building a house, I go, Jesus knew how to build a house. 
That's kind of cool that Jesus knew construction, right? The early part of his life was he was a builder. He was a carpenter. He was someone, in fact, that Greek word that we translate carpenter really is this idea of a builder. He's, he's someone that would know how to construct a, a house, probably built many of them. And that Jesus uses this, this example that definitely came from his real life. And I, I, I have great admiration for those of you who know the trades and know how to build stuff because I do not like, and I just really appreciate those of you that do, like, and, and I appreciate that about Jesus, that he knew how to build a sturdy house during this time. And there's two different comparisons, right? There's someone who built a house on a really poor, really false foundation. This is not something that's going to stand up. And it looked fine for a little while, but then the storm came. And the storm revealed the reality of that foundation. And then there's someone else who built, a found, built their house on a rock. And that house had a strong foundation. And so when that storm came, then it was revealed which house was built um, in, a, in a durable, solid kind of way. Right? The, the kid's song that wise man built his house upon the rock, wise man built his house upon the rock. Yeah, how many of you know that song? Okay, well, should we sing it? No, let's, no, let's not sing it. The, the rain came down and the floods came up. Rains came down, floods came up. House on the rock stood firm. And for those of you that remember the song, when we get to the other part, foolish man built his house on the sand. Foolish man built his house on the sand. Rains came tumbling down. Rains came down, floods came up. Rains came down, floods came up. And the house on the sand went splat. You learned that one too. Okay, good. This one, the lyrics I found online said smash, but I learned it splat. The house on the sand went splat. Now that's... A fun kid's song. I really liked that one growing up. I always liked that part, splat. But again, when we think about our life, boy, I don't want a life that goes splat. I want a life that stands firm. And Jesus says the difference between a life that goes splat, the, gr- the fell and great was the fall of it, and the life that stands firm in those storms is what your life is built upon. And Jesus is leading us and leading his original hearers down this path of recognizing how much they need him. We need Jesus. You need Jesus. I need Jesus. We need a life built upon him and built upon his grace. When I planned this series, like, I, you know, there's a group of us that will discuss, you know, and I'll float ideas by them, kind of, hey, I'm thinking about doing the Sermon on the Mount. And when I was thinking about talking about the Sermon on the Mount leading up to Easter and really taking a long walk through this, I was, I had a different impression in my mind about the Sermon on the Mount, to be honest. When I was kind of thinking over, overview, it's like, oh, be really encouraging to spend a lot of time in just the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, this kind of long teaching of Jesus would be this really good preparation for Easter time, but I was thinking about it differently than it's kind of turned out because there's been so many moments through this series where I've just been confronted by the teachings of Jesus. And Brandon mentioned this last week in his sermon, the the idea of, he's like, I haven't really enjoyed this, to be honest, just because it's been real sobering to think about what Jesus has been telling his followers and telling them about, we just see his kingdom on display. This is the kind of life that I want you to live. And this is the kind of life I'm going to help you live. And then we, it's like a mirror. We look at our own lives and we look at the teachings of Jesus and we go, wow, like I, it doesn't match exactly, right? We, I, I see areas in my own life where I fall so far short of this life that Jesus is describing. But you know, this is the season leading up to Easter. Today is Palm Sunday. And traditionally in the church, this, these weeks leading up to Easter are a time of introspection, right? This is a time of searching our hearts. And so this series has been perfect for that because it has been forcing me and hopefully encouraging you to look inward and to consider your own life and to consider your heart and to consider what does my life look like compared to what Jesus is describing here? We said this during the first week or maybe the second week of the series that Oswald Chambers said this about the Sermon on the Mount. It produces despair in the heart of the natural man. And that's the very thing Jesus means it to do because immediately we reach the point of despair. We are willing to come to Jesus Christ as beggars. 
and receive from him. When we see this part of our life that doesn't match up with what Jesus is offering, we go, ah, I need something here. I need, and Jesus offers himself. He says, you need me. I'm the one who came to lead you into this kind of life. I'm the one who will build this kind of life in you. Sinclair Ferguson, great Scottish pastor with an amazing accent, he said, this is not something that we work up, but it's something that must come down. We, we don't work ourselves up to living a life that matches the Sermon on the Mount. It's something that Jesus gives us. It's something we receive from him. It must come down because we can't work it up ourselves. And it involves living this life that Jesus offers, involves dying to ourselves. It involves giving up our own prerogative of being the one who's in charge and finally and decidedly giving that over to Jesus and saying, Jesus, I want you to live your life through me. Please live your life through me. And then continually deciding, you know, Jesus talks about taking up your cross daily. So I think there's this idea where it's this once, once and for all decision, and then it's a continual decision that we give our lives over to Jesus and we say, I want you to live your life through me. I want this kind of life. I want this to be true of me. Your will, not mine. Just like the Lord's Prayer from a few weeks ago. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We continually went back to this quote by Oswald Chambers, another quote that was that he came to make us what he teaches us we should be. On Palm Sunday, this was the day where the people in Jerusalem welcomed Jesus into the city. And Jesus came riding on the, the donkey, not a war horse, but coming in as this gentle um, fulfillment of prophecy, a king that was coming back victorious. It's kind of the imagery. There's so much going on. Kylan actually preached about that last Wednesday down in, in Bucerias in Mexico. And there's this, this image of the city welcoming Jesus in. And they've got the palm branches. They're laying those palm branches down. They're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and welcoming him into the city. And we know that for, for many of them, it was sort of a shallow level of commitment, right? Because just days later, Jesus is dying his death on the cross, and the crowds that welcomed him are now, probably some of them jeering now and, and mocking him. And we have this opportunity um, during this season, and even right now, to really welcome Jesus as our king, to offer our lives more fully to him, because there isn't a third way. There isn't th this, this kind of marginal commitment to Jesus. Walking with Jesus involves all of us. It involves giving over our entire lives to him. And I encourage you this morning, if you've been, if you've been marginal, if you've been kind of mixed up in your commitment to him, to take some time as we close in a moment to recommit. Or if you've never given your life to Jesus, I encourage you this morning to give your life fully over to him and to begin to follow him, receive by grace through faith this gift of, of life, this new life that he offers. You know, when you look at a um, list of ingredients on a whatever it is, you know, something that has an ingredients list, and I was surprised to see that this bottle of water had ingredients on it. Um, you'll never guess what the first one is. It's water. You're right. You did. You guessed. But you notice that how, how the ingredients list works is like the, the most of something is the top list, right? The top thing on the list of ingredients. And you go down and there's smaller and smaller amounts. So good thing water is the first one. That would be really disturbing if it wasn't because that's, you know, majority of what's in here is water. Then it's potassium bicarbonate, sodium bicarbonate, calcium citrate, sodium chloride, and magnesium oxide, for whatever reason. Those other things are in there. Taste or, I don't know, whatever. But when you think about your life, if your life had a list of ingredients, how far up the list would Jesus be? Would he be top? That's what I'm, that's what I'm encouraging you to, to make a decision that he is the top. He's the, he's the number one in your life. He's not just kind of a mix in there but he is number one. Would you pray with me?